does mean two warm-ups and two exit tickets. Obviously, you guys are going to have a lot of time to get these done because this unit is going to go all the way until December 2nd because of the Thanksgiving break. Um, so, you know, just keep that, file that somewhere in your in your mind so you don't forget to do it at some point. Thanks for joining us, Gabby. All right, let's jump into it. So the title of today's lesson, the first part, is Ecosystems and Human Activities. Yesterday's date was November 19th, 2020. Uh, and again, we're gonna combine two lessons into one. The objective of this first half of the lesson, biologists will be able to infer how human activities may impact the environment. And our essential questions, what does anthropogenic mean, big word, but if we break it down, it should make sense. And how, how have humans negatively impacted the earth? So that's what we should be thinking about as we move through this lesson. <clears throat> and we should keep our objective in mind as well. So please, please, please take notes. There are asynchronous assignments associated with today's lesson per usual. So I want you all to be prepared to do those assignments. Hopefully you all have also noticed that on several of the assignments we've had so far, I leave comments on your writing. I leave comments on your answers so you can go back and try to improve them if you choose. Obviously all of our assignments are set up so that you have at least two attempts. So if you're not happy or you're not pleased with the first grade, you can go back and, and try it again uh, based on the comments that I've left, the feedback that I've given. All right, uh-oh, what happened? Sorry, let me do this. Fade out. Fade out. All right, so an ecosystem is defined as a community made up of interacting biotic and abiotic factors. That's really the most important part of the definition. We've got to have some type of interaction taking place between biotic factors and abiotic factors. What does the word biotic mean? Living. Does it mean something else? Castro? Living or alive. Living. Is that what you were going to say, Ayana? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Good. So biotic factors are living things. And then obviously, abiotic must be non living. Non -living. Thank you. So, within an ecosystem, you're going to have living things interacting with non living things. And in some ways, they rely on each other. Not totally, obviously. The weather doesn't really care what human beings or uh, butterflies or the grass has going on. It's going to rain if it's going to rain. It's going to be hot if it's going to be hot. The weather doesn't really matter that much. But something like soil certainly depends on what's growing out of the soil and, and what animals are eating the food that's coming out of that soil and what human interactions are doing to the soil. So there is some type of dependency in both directions. Okay, but let's do this. This should be pretty easy for you all. Soil, would that be biotic or abiotic? Biotic. Whoa, soil is living? Abiotic. Yeah. Abiotic, but I do wanna hear you make that, that case, Castro. Why do you say soil is living? It's oh, nitrogen. What'd you say? Nutrients. Okay, so it so certainly soil has nutrients. Um, but let's think all the way back to unit two. What's the smallest unit of life called? It's a four letter word. So. A cell, good, yeah. Um, so you need, you need something that is cellular in order for it to be considered life. And that thing also needs to be able to do um, certain things like reproduce, like 
breathe, uh, like exchange materials with its environment. So soil, we wouldn't consider living, but you could maybe make a case based on the things that are moving around in it, that if you scooped out some soil, inevitably you're gonna have some life in there. <clears throat> okay, what about elephants? That's bionic. Okay, what about air? Thank you, Kiki. Thank you, Ayana. Abiotic. Abiotic. We've got a lot of participation today. What about carbon? Abiotic. Abiotic. Carbon is an element. So when you all take chemistry next year, you'll learn a lot about that. What about trees? Biotic. Biotic. Sunlight. Abiotic. 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 Good. Bacteria. Biotic. Biotic. Viruses. Abiotic. 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 Good. Um, so viruses cannot reproduce by themselves. So really, they are just basically like packages of, of DNA. What about grass? Biotic. Biotic. And then biotic as well for pandas. All right, cool. So we're clear on what kind of makes something biotic or abiotic. Oh, I'm upset with myself. Okay, so there's not necessarily anything that you need to write down here. Maybe this first sentence. There are many types of ecosystems that we find across our planet. Ecosystems can be as large as a continent or as small as a pond. So it's important to remember that one of the most important abiotic factors is water. We didn't have it on that last page, but water is an abiotic factor that provides an environment for a majority of life's species, a majority of Earth's life forms to exist. As you all know, water covers about 70% of the Earth's surface. So water is extremely, extremely important as an abiotic factor. But an ecosystem could literally be, you can make a plate, you can make a case that your intestines are an ecosystem and, and the bacteria that live there um, have their own small ecosystem there. You could make a case that the savanna desert um, is an ecosystem, right? So something that's very, very large or something that's very, very small. In either case, there are going to be abiotic factors that play a large role. Rainfall, temperature, humidity, soil quality, air quality, altitude, these all play a role in the type of life that you're going to see. Mr. Rudd? Yes. Did you know that Antarctica is actually considered a desert because it doesn't have any trees and stuff? Yeah. And it's, yeah. Even though it's not That's hot, it's cold. And Why can't we go into Antarctica? Antarctica? What'd you say? Why can't we go into Antarctica? Uh, there are some, there are some uh, research hubs, or I don't even know what I would call them, research complexes that are in Antarctica that are, you know. I know, but they don't let you, like, the only way you can go to Antarctica is if you, like, go on a tour, and then they don't take you, like, throughout the whole Antarctica. Why, why not? Yeah, so I, you're saying there, why is there no tourism there? No, no, I'm just saying, like, why can't people, like, actually go there? Because if you go too far, the government will turn you around. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Who knows? Uh, Maybe. I mean, I, would you say, Ayana? Maybe there's another Area 51. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, that that information is rife for conspiracies because you're like, oh, what don't they want us to know? I have no idea. Um, I've never heard, I didn't know that that was a thing. So we can look into it. You, in fact, you should look into it and report back to us. Maybe they might freeze if they go too far south, north or south. What's that, Alicia? Maybe they might, people might freeze as they go too far north or south. Yes, definitely. It's dangerous to be in an environment that is that cold. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure why the government, you know, would prevent you. I don't, I don't know. Isn't Alaska cold too? And 
Yeah, so we can sense. see, we, if we look at this map, we can see that this gray, if you see any gray area, that represents a tundra. Now, a tundra is basically what you were talking about, Ayana. It's basically a desert. It's just a very cold desert, um, one that is probably characterized by ice, um, a landscape of ice. As we can see, Greenland. Now, this is, um, if any of you have ever taken or will take AP by or AP Human Geography, you'll learn about different types of maps. And every map has its strengths and every map has its weaknesses. This type of map, um, the weakness here, the strength is that the, the water distance is pretty accurate. So the distance over the oceans is, is pretty accurate here. The problem is that uh, as you get closer to the poles, so the further north you go in this map or the further south you go, the land gets distorted. It looks a lot bigger than it actually is. So for example, in this map, Greenland, which is this big island right here, looks like it's the exact same size or maybe just a little bit smaller than Africa. But in reality, Africa is about six times bigger than Greenland. Um, even Al Alaska looks like it's about, you know, the size of the continental United States or maybe two thirds the size of the continental United States. Alaska is very big, but it's not nearly as big as it looks on this map. So the further north and south you get on this map, the, the more distorted it looks. But as we can see, there are vast amounts of land that are tundras, um, both in the north and small bits in Antarctica in the south. Most of Antarctica is ice though. We can also see that there is a uh, seasonal forest, a boreal seasonal forest in northeastern Russia. It's also probably extremely cold, um, but it's not considered a tundra because there are trees there. So that goes back to what you were saying, Ayana. We can see that there are deserts all over the world, really. Um, even here in Chile and Peru, there's the Atacama Desert. It's probably difficult to see, but there's a little bit of pink space right there. We've got a desert in what is basically Utah in the United States. But the biggest desert of them all in right here in Northern Africa, spanning about six or seven countries. What else can we point out here? We've got the Amazon rainforest, um, but that, that's the forest we're most familiar with, but we can even look up into Central, Central America. Um, countries like Honduras, Panama, Costa Rica, El Salvador, they are also characterized by these tropical evergreen forests. We can also look in Southeast Asia. So what you're really noticing is that the latitude, the altitude, and the proximity to the ocean really determines the type of biome that you're going to see. So I think that's a pretty cool map. Okay, so question. What is the relationship between biotic and abiotic factors in an ecosystem? Which one depends on which? What do you all think? Can I say something? Yes, you can. So in the um, left picture right there with the soil and the plants, the plants need to be in the soil so they can grow and they gain nutrients when you um, water them and the sunlight. So soil is really important to their, um, what's the, I'm trying to find the right word. To soil is, is necessary. It's really, it's necessary for plants to be able to grow. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I agree with that. And let me ask you this, and not necessarily you, Ayana, but just the class. Where do the nutrients come from? The nutrients um, from the soil? Yeah, where, do the, where does the soil get its nutrients? For, um, the soil gets its nutrients from, like, the plant, I mean, like, animals and stuff, you know, like, when they die and decay. It goes Excellent. Yeah, so as plants and animals die and decay, the nutrients that were once a part of their bodies is 
reincorporated into the ground. So we see this life cycle taking place um, as different elements and different nutrients contribute to the plants. The plants then get eaten. Then maybe something else comes along and eats that thing. And then those things die. And those nutrients and chemicals are returned to the soil. And it just kind of starts over again. So it's really quite a, a, a genius process. Um, and you all are going to talk more about that in chemistry. And maybe some of you will go on to take AP biology and talk a lot more about those things. But Ayana really summed it up quite well. Biotic factors depend on abiotic factors for survival, respiration, photosynthesis, shelter, uh, in, in her example, nutrients, so food. But biotic factors also can influence their environments as well. So a beaver, beavers build what? What do beavers build? Dams. Yes, thank you, Omari. Beavers build dams. And dams can totally disrupt the flow of water through a river. Um, and so in that case, they are absolutely influencing their environment. They're changing the ab abiotic factors um, in their environment. And that's just one example. But, and at, you could look anywhere. Or you can look all around you and see it happening. <clears throat> so typically, we do organize life on Earth in these five levels. An organism would be an individual animal, plant, or even a unicellular life form like a bacterium. So something that's an individual. A population is multiple organisms of the same species living together in a group. So this might be a flock of birds. Uh, this might be a school of fish. This might be you know, a neighborhood of human beings. This might be a colony of bacteria. but they're all from the same species. A community is multiple populations that live together in a defined area. So typically we think of this community as consisting of multiple species. The ecosystem, multiple communities with biotic organisms interacting with the abiotic factors. And then lastly, the biosphere the part of Earth that contains all ecosystems. So you all are probably pretty familiar with these terms and these concepts from your Earth and environmental classes. But we just want to go over it again. Pretty easy stuff, simple stuff. Uh oh. Uh, I didn't set up the Padlet, so you all can answer the question in the chat as we watch this video. It's a pretty good one. This guy's got some good stuff to say. How have we, human beings, impacted the environment? Fact. Planet Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Mankind, about 140,000 years old. Let me put that in perspective. If you condense the Earth's lifespan, 24 hours that's one full day then we have been here on this planet for drum roll please three seconds three seconds and look what we've done we have modestly named ourselves homo sapiens meaning wise man but is man really so wise smart yes and it's good to be smart but not too smart for your own good yes we have split the atom Yes, we build clever machines that navigate the universe in search of new homes, but at the same time, those atoms we split created nuclear warfare. In our quest to explore the galaxy, rejects and neglects the home that we have here now, so no, that cannot be wisdom. Wisdom is different. While intelligence speaks, wisdom listens, and we willingly covered our ears to Mother Nature's screams and closed our eyes to all of her help-wanted signs. 
Wisdom knows that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if we were wise, we would not be shocked when we see storms that are stronger than ever before or more drought, hurricanes, and wildfire than ever before because there's more pollution than ever before, more carbon, more trees cut down than ever before. At a record pace, we have increased the extinction of animals by 1,000 times the normal rate. What a feat. In the next 10 to 100 years, every beloved animal character in every children's book is predicted to go extinct. Lions gone, rhinos gone, tiger, gorilla, elephant, polar bear gone in three seconds. Species that have been here longer than us will be gone because of us in this three seconds. In an existence shorter than a Vine video, we turn the circle of life into our own personal conveyor belt. Somebody, anybody help. We were given so much. The only planet in this solar system with life. I mean, we are one in a million. No, actually, scientifically, we are one in a billion, trillion, trillion. That's a one followed by 33 zeros. And I don't want to get too spiritual, but how are we not a miracle? We are perfectly positioned to the sun so we don't burn, but not too distant so we don't turn to ice. Goldilocks said it best. We are just right. This paradise where we are given medicine from trees. Not coincidentally, but because like the song says, we are family. Literally, everything, every species is connected genetically from the sunflower to the sunfish. And this is what we must recognize before it's too late. Because the real crisis is not global warming, environmental destruction, or animal agriculture. It is us. These problems are symptoms of us. Byproducts of us are in a reflection. Loss of connection has created this misdirection We have forgotten that everything contributes to the perfection of mother nature Corporations keep us unaware and disconnected But they have underestimated our strength Contrary to popular belief Millions are waking up out of their sleep Seeing our home being taken right up under our feet we cannot allow our history to be written by the wicked, greedy, and loony. It is our duty to protect Mother Nature from those who refuse to see her beauty. Call me crazy, but I believe we should have the right to eat food that's safe with ingredients we can pronounce. Drink water that is clean. Marvel at trees. Breathe air free of toxins. These are natural rights, not things that can be bargained for in Congress. See, they want you to feel powerless, but it has been said that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wing can cause a typhoon halfway around the world but when enough people come together we too will make waves and watch the world into a new era filled with love and connection freedom for all without oppression but it is up to you yes you watching this behind this screen to make the effort because time is of the essence and only together can we make it to the fourth second Video. Yes, he's quite talented. <laughs> do you have a link to that, or do you know what it's called so I can look it on uh, up on YouTube later? Uh, I should be able to share a link. Oops. All right, so he touched on some of the many ways that human beings have impacted the environment, but let's keep going. Let's think about some others. We Fun have 252, so let's keep going. So what human impact do you see in this image? This is an image of some type of interstate highway system. I don't know where, but what's the human impact of this? They cut down trees. There certainly was a lot of probably a lot of trees and grasses that had to be cut uh, in order to make space for this. What else? Animal um, being um, run away. What'd you say, Justice? Animals got to find somewhere else to live. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it, when you cut down a, a forest, essentially, you, you're not just removing the trees, you're also forcing the things that rely on the trees to move elsewhere. You're destroying a habitat. That's good, what else? I was going to say that it's probably polluted, not polluted, but well, you know, a lot of people, they like to throw stuff out their cars, throw stuff on the ground, throw stuff anywhere that they don't really care. So probably like polluted around there. Good. Not yeah. So not the air, but the ground. And stuff. Yeah. And I, I would even say that the air probably is as well. And, and yeah, more than that, that too. yeah. And, and more than that, there's also, you know, we're going to talk more about this, but there's such a thing called 
sound pollution because some some animals really don't like being near very noisy places. Um, and there's also heat pollution. So if you were to look at a heat map of the state of North Carolina, the hottest places, even though we basically live in the same general ecosystem, the hottest places are the cities because you've got so many cars that are contributing to the heat. You've got so many people and so many concrete buildings and structures contributing to heat as well. Um, so all of that, and pollution is a great way to summarize that. So it's not just the, the, uh, the fact that people are littering, but it's, it's all of those types of pollution that are contributing. Let's look at another one. What about here? This is a picture of the Great Garbage Patch in the Pacific Ocean. That's real? That's real. Yes, this is real. <laughs> where where is that? Uh, we can see. It. So, <clears throat> garbage in the Pacific Ocean, in the Pacific Ocean, and really in all of the oceans across the across the globe, they, it gets they get sucked in to this, this singular place by the the ocean currents. Um, so let me come over here. And people swim in that. No, people, I mean, that he's probably a scientist. He might even be a conservationist trying to remove garbage. But you can see that, you can see in this image, let me blow it up. There are ocean currents. So this is the western coast of the United States. This is the Pacific Ocean. So the ocean currents will carry trash off of the coast and into um, basically two or three specific places that become these gigantic garbage patches. So it's not good, not good. That's what we have to do. Why haven't more people tried to clean it up? Uh, there are actually pretty, and there are pretty, and I saw your- You see how much trash that is? There are a lot, there are a lot of efforts um, to clean this up, but it's it's not always as simple as just kind of like taking a net and just dragging it through the water and picking up as much trash as possible because a That's lot of that trash has over. been there, you know, once it's been exposed to the sun and once it's been exposed to water for months at a time, it disintegrates. Um, and so it becomes particulate matter that's really not easy to get out of the to get out of the water and it sometimes is eaten by fish. Um, so there are some actually, there are some pretty innovative technologies now that are trying to do a better job at getting those small pieces. Cause you know, it's easy to just, like I said, you can just get a net, but then the question becomes, what do you do with it all? Um, and that's really the reason why it's there in the first place is uh, at some point we are going to run out of land to bury our trash. Um, and it's not a good thing to put it in the water. And a lot of it can't be burned either because it will be poisonous. Um, so we've got to really think about, you know, some, some different solutions to getting rid of the waste. Why can't they put it in space? And I have seen I have seen some uh, recent innovations that are that are suggesting that, but um, at the same time, we ha we don't yet know what the impact of that could be. You know, space is not something that we've really fully explored, so. Um, we're not exactly sure, you know, if that would be the most responsible thing either. Just like now we've got people who obviously argue that it's not responsible for us to do this with our trash, put it in the ocean or bury it. At some point in the next, you know, maybe it might not be for several generations, but at some point people might be arguing we shouldn't be putting our, our trash into space either. So really the, the best solution is to not create as much waste, to try to reuse and recycle as much as we possibly can. Okay, do you see any human impact in this picture? This is kind of curious to me. We've got a, a nice sunset that's kind of brightly coloring the sky and we see some clouds. Do you guys think that there's any human impact there? Yes, I think maybe. What do you um, think? Well, I heard that usually when the, the sky is colored, that means there's pollution in the air. Okay. That certainly can be a cause. Malachi, did you have something? Yeah, um, like, like in Colorado, when I go down there, it's like that because like pollution in the air, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, so yeah. especially in, in, Western, in Western states, the problem is, is much worse because of two reasons really. Western states have 
a higher humidity. They're, they're a lot hotter. Um, and then they also, most of the Western cities specifically live in, they exist in a valley. So you've got the Rocky Mountains on the West Coast. And then on the other side of that, of those mountains are the city landscapes. And then you've got the coast. So what happens because of that is all the air coming in from the coast uh, kind of comes through the city. It picks up all of that pollution, all of that smog, but then it kind of runs into this wall on the mountains, which have their own air streams. And so what, what ends up happening is it just kind of circulates over the cities and you end up with a lot of pollution uh, in LA, in San Diego, San Francisco, um, and Phoenix to a certain degree as well. So perhaps this could be natural. We don't know. Sometimes when you see brightly colored skies like this, it is just because of a beautiful sunset. But sometimes you see it and it's, it, is a cause, it is caused by pollution. What about this? Flooding. Uh, I'm not exactly sure which Southeast Asian country this is, but obviously pretty severe flooding. What's the human impact of that? Um... I think the weather. Can you say more about that, Gabby? Um, like, like I heard that hurricanes can like cause like big floods. Yeah, yeah. So as we're gonna see, I've got some interesting graphs for you guys to take a look at. But as we're gonna see, um, because of global warming, many of our weather events are not only increasing in frequency, so they're happening more often and we're having more of them in a single year, but they're also becoming much more dramatic, and much more damaging. Um, so floods are getting more severe and they're also moving further and further into the coast. Hurricanes are becoming stronger and, and hurricane winds are becoming stronger. Uh, tornadoes Rudd. are becoming more frequent. Mr. Rudd. Yes. Do you hear about um, the US has to find another like country for our food because China's flooding right now and all their crops got flooded. Really? Yeah, China's flooding right now. We got to find a new like resource for food. Wow. I did not hear that. Um, and the the politics of that, I'm sure, also don't make things any easier. So I'll have to look that up too. You're, you're really putting me onto a lot of information today. <laughs> okay. Um, what about this? This is kind of related to what Gabby was just talking about, but what's the human impact here? Hi, it's getting doesn't hot. it have anything to do with global warming and stuff like that? Yeah, and I heard Malachi, you say it's getting hot as well. So what, we've heard that term, global warming, come up twice now. What does that mean? What is global warming? Earth warming up because of our atmospheric pressure. Okay. Um, Atmospheric pressure is playing a role. It's uh, caused, I think it's caused by greenhouse gases. Good, so greenhouse gases and the greenhouse effect is really what's causing global warming. Um, and atmospheric pressure does come into play because of that greenhouse effect. But um, greenhouse gases is really what we think of when we think of the cause of global warming. Um, and we're not talking about, you know, some people, who might be a little less informed would say, well, it's not any hotter or any colder than it once was. In fact, last winter it snowed more than it ever has since 1992. So global warming is a myth. Um, what we have to think about is global warming is not just your day-to-day -day weather. Global warming is climate change. Um, climate change analyzes all of the different aspects of weather. So humidity, temperature, air pressure, um, precipitation levels, all of these things that we can collect data about and analyze them and see that things are on average increasing. It's, the planet is on average getting hotter and it's not necessarily in Charlotte on a year to year basis. It's not necessarily in Chicago on a year to year basis, but in general, the, globe, the global temperature is increasing um, and it has increased about two degrees over the last 40 years and if we go, um, if we go much hotter than we are currently, the prediction is that the damage will be irreversible. So this kind of goes back to what we were talking about um, just now, that weather events are becoming more frequent and more damaging. Um, you can see the size of this hurricane. It's gigantic. It's bigger than the state of Florida right here. 
Um, and I'm not exactly sure which hurricane this was or when it was, but I can almost guarantee that it had some effect on the Charlotte area, which was, which is basically right up here somewhere. Um, so the rain from that certainly would have had some type of impact. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rudd. Mm -hmm. Um, I just remembered you said you wanted to look up like the flooding and stuff. You're going to have to go to Google Translate and type in flood in English and translate it to Chinese and then type it in Twitter. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, it's bought from U.S. servers. Wow. Okay. You're, uh, you, you sound like a big conspiracy guy. Is that true? No, I'm not like a conspiracy guy. I just like the truth. Okay. <clears throat> As do I. Okay, so you guys are going to, because you are in our honors class, you're going to make your own presentations and partners about these seven topics. Population growth, pollution, climate change, burning fossil fuels, introducing invasive species, ozone depletion, and bioaccumulation. I'm going to talk about that at the end of the lesson. But let's just very quickly run through what these topics are. So obviously population growth describes how the number of people on Earth has increased exponentially over the last 150 years since the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> so in this graph, we can see that taking place. And the reason it's taking place is that across the globe, so all the people on Earth, about 220,000 more people are born every day than, either, than the number of people who die. Okay, so that's a huge, <laughs> that's a huge discrepancy. And obviously that leads to population growth. If every day you have 220,000 more people being born than dying, uh, your population grows very, very quickly. Um, so we can see that the total population increased because of that. Uh, and already this year, just this year, 72 million more people, uh, the population has increased by 72 million people. Just the year. graph, that graph is for this year? This is not a, this is not a specific graph. This is just kind of demonstrating what happens so what we can see is that uh, we've got birth and death rates. So in the beginning, in a country that, let's look at, so we, in a country that's in stage one of its development, I thought I talked about this with you guys. Um, a country that's in stage one of its development, meaning they're pretty poor, they don't have resources to take care of their population. People are dying of very um, simple things like malaria. Uh, people are dying of famine. People are dying of thirst. Um, the birth rate is high and the death rate is high. The reason for that, the death rate is high for all the reasons I just said. People are dying of very simple things that in a country like the United States, you would never die from, from that. Um, and the birth rate's high because they are a poor country, which means that most people are growing their own food. So it helps to have uh, seven children, eight children, if you are, number one, expecting that probably at least one of them will die before they reach adulthood. Um, but number two, it helps to have that many kids because they can help grow, they can help farm. Um, so the birth rate is high and the death rate is high. So essentially the population isn't growing. You have a lot of people being born, but you also have a lot of people dying. Um, as you, as countries start to industrialize and develop, the death rate drops dramatically because they start to become richer. Um, they can afford better technologies, better medicines. The sanitation becomes better as you develop sewage pipes and people aren't, you know, dumping their sewage, their waste into their drinking sources. So the death rate drops dramatically, but the birth rate is still high because people haven't really wrapped their minds around the fact that, oh, instead of my lifespan being 38, my lifespan is now 78, which means that it not only do I have the opportunity to have more kids, but my kids have the opportunity to have more kids. So the birth rate is still high. So at this point in stage two, your population is growing very quickly. Eventually your birth rate still falls uh, or your birth rate will begin to fall as people have better reproductive health. Um, they start using contraceptives uh, and also it becomes expensive to have kids. Once you move from a rural environment, from a farm into an urban environment, let's say you're in search of some type of jobs, well, it's no longer easy or cheap to have eight kids in a one or two bedroom 
apartment you know, or maybe even a studio apartment and you've got to share that space with someone else. You've got to feed all those mouths. So it doesn't make sense to have eight kids anymore. So you see the birth rate start to drop. Eventually, both the birth rate and the death rate are low. And this would be a stage four country. So a stage one country that we might think of could be, uh, what should I say? Let's maybe, let's, let's say Rwanda is a stage one country. Very poor as a result of a civil war. So they've got high birth rate, high death rate. They're still really in the midst of that civil war. A stage two country might be um, Vietnam. They're slowly starting to industrialize, but they still have a lot of poor people who have yet to you know, be touched by that industrialization. A stage three country where the birth rate is starting to fall at this point is China. Um, a stage four country would be the United States and a stage five country might be Italy. Um, a stage five country is essentially going to start to see some population decline because people are having maybe only one child. When you have one child, obviously that's not going to replace you and your partner. So the population will start to fall. <clears throat> so this is a cool thing that this is basically AP human geography, but it's a cool thing to acknowledge. We can see the, the global population here. Um, obviously the dotted lines represent projections up until 2100. <clears throat> but we can see that much of the growth today is happening in Asia and in Africa. Europe's population is actually dropping. Uh, the population in North America is going up, but, but very, very slowly. Same thing in South America. The dramatic growth is happening in the two most populated continents, Asia and Africa. The reason for this is because they are now industrializing. Um, China is, as we're going to see, China is growing. Um, they're getting richer. The Chinese economy is expected to surpass the U.S. economy for the first time in five years. Um, Nigeria is also growing in, a in Africa. So we can see that by 2100, though, the population is expected to stop growing. And the interesting thing is that even though Asia and Africa are growing very dramatically, unfortunately, most of those people are still living in extreme poverty, which means that they are making less than a dollar a day um, and having to support not only themselves, but also their families on less than a dollar a day. So that is, uh, that's a huge challenge, not only for those countries, but also for the globe. How do you feed people on a, who are making a dollar a day? How do you um, make sure they're living in a sanitized, hygienic environment? I have a question. Yes. You know, um, well, um, I don't know, but um, aren't there places that are like wealthy in those countries, different places? Yes. So uh, China, I'm, I'm going to try not to go off on too long of a tangent here. China is a communist country. It's a communist country. And so because of that, they don't practice the same capitalism that we practice here in the United States. Capitalism essentially allows business in the United States to take priority over everything else. So if you want to start your own business, you can do that. You can make money for yourself. You don't necessarily, you obviously have to pay some taxes, but you don't necessarily have to consult the government about what that business is going to do, how it's going to produce things, um, what your ownership is going to be. You can just make those decisions on your own. Obviously, again, you have to pay some taxes but uh, it's not very controlled. It's not very regulated here. That's what capitalism looks like. In, the, in China, because they are a communist country, uh, it's from most, the vast majority of their country is governed by very strict laws, which say that only certain people can start businesses. They have to get permission from the government. They have to have government representation in the business. Again, they still have to pay taxes but also their means of production are controlled. So they don't have as much say so over where they buy their materials, where they sell their goods, um, things like that. China, however, about let's say 70 years ago, no, how long ago was it? 60 years ago, about 60 years ago in the 1960s, uh, created these opportunity zones um, or they call them these zones of economic development. Um, and in those zones of economic development, it resembles much more the capitalistic system that we have here in the United States. So China realized 
in the 1960s, our population, as we can see, is exploding. But we are not making any more money. At that time, the Chinese uh, economy was about a tenth of the size of the United States economy, but they had probably about 10 times the number of people. <clears throat> uh, that obviously creates a huge problem. And so maybe not 10 times, maybe about five times the number of people. But essentially, they, they decided that they needed to find a way to make more money. So they created these uh, zones of economic development where they allowed companies to start without having so much government intervention. And what that did was very quickly it allowed the country to make a lot more money. And so now, in the span of only 60 years, the United States has been building its economy since uh, the 1700s. <laughs> uh, but in the span of 60 years, China has gone from being a tenth of the size of our economy to, as I said, in about five years, they are expected to surpass the uh, United States economy at about $25 trillion a year, so a huge amount of money. <clears throat> but we can see China is the most populous country in the world. Um, in, tw in 2020, they will, they're expected to have about uh, 1.45 billion people. Uh, in the United States, we are hovering around 350 million people. So China is uh, about four, four and a half times the size of the United States. Even India, which is another, it's another Asian country, it's in South Asia. India is a country that has almost 1.4 billion people. And then after that, there's a big drop off. But we can see <clears throat> Nigeria and Indonesia are quickly catching up to the United States. And so we will eventually be surpassed as the third most populous country in the world. Um, it's unlikely that we will be surpassed by Brazil because Brazil's population is leveling off as well. Um, so we'll probably settle in at about the fifth most populous country in the world in the next 20 years or so. Pollution is also a problem. So I'm just going to run through these pictures. We can see these refineries, these factories. Uh, some of that is obviously water vapor, which is not harmful, but some of it is probably methane, carbon dioxide, CFCs, um, which are harmful to the ozone, to the atmosphere. Uh, this is illegal in most places. You cannot actually, you know, just dump your, your waste products into, uh, into the water source. But companies have been found to do that illegally and they have been sued because of it. Um, and it continues to happen anyway. Mr. Roy. Yes. Then or some of our ozone layer break? Yes, I'm gonna get to that too. Uh, uh, even wind turbines, so what I was talking about earlier, wind turbines are thought to be a good thing because they produce renewable energy, right? So the wind is obviously, as long as we have oceans, there will be wind. Um, so it's renewable energy. And so that's thought to be a good thing for our environment. But we also have to acknowledge that they provide sound and also space pollution. Um, there have been studies that have shown that wind turbines have totally disrupted bird migration patterns and actually killed many birds every year as the birds just aren't used to these large structures being in their natural uh, migration pattern. And they're also not used to this moving thing. So they run into it, they get killed. Um, the owners of these wind turbines have found, you know, dozens of dead birds surrounding their turbines every year. Climate change. So obviously this is a result of human activities as the earth is getting hotter. Ayana correctly mentioned the greenhouse effect. So naturally, sun from or heat from the sun penetrates the earth. We know that early on in the, in the earth's history, you guys read that and you, you guys wrote about this, but um, early on in the earth's history, four billion years ago, there was no oxygen, so there was no ozone. Ozone is made out of oxygen. Um, so because of that, the heat from the sun and also the UV radiation from the sun was very, very harsh. Um, and it killed all the life that was, you know, that could have existed on land. Then we have some life that began to develop in the water. Some of that life began to do photosynthesis and they produced oxygen. That oxygen eventually created an ozone. So now 
some of that heat that penetrates Earth or penetrates from the sun into Earth. Uh, it bounces off the Earth, and some of it gets trapped by the ozone, but uh, it, most of it eventually gets released back into space. Uh, the problem is that, let me see if I can find the correct image. Come back to these. Uh, the problem is that when we introduce carbon dioxide and other products like CFCs, which came from aerosol sprays and some types of refrigerators, as we introduce those into our environment, a hole opened up into the in the atmosphere into the in the ozone, which meant that more heat, more UV radiation was penetrating the atmosphere. Um, the good news is that in 2019, the hole was as small. As it's, as it's been since we started measuring it. So it's, it's shrinking, the hole is getting smaller, um, but we still have to find other ways of negating the damage that we've already done. Okay. We can also look at marine life and, and kind of see signs of global warming there. So the coral that exists in the Great Barrier Reef, coral is actually a living animal, it's not a plant. Um, but much of that coral is dying, it's getting bleached um, because the water temperatures are rising dramatically. And so scientists are actually predicting now that the Great Barrier Reef uh, will cease to exist in the next decade or so, and it, it will be permanently damaged. So as you all get older and you might have some opportunities to travel, uh, I would definitely encourage you to, to go off to Australia and see it because you might not have the chance. We can look at specific um, types of fish. These three fish species on the northeastern coast of the United States, here's New Jersey, here's New York, here's Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Um, these are all states that thrive on a fishing industry. But as the global temperatures get hotter, the waters of the Atlantic Ocean get water, hotter. So these fish swim north where the water is going to be cooler. So what we're seeing is that fish that we used to find on the coast of, what state is this, Virginia, we're now finding all the way up on the coast of New Jersey, which is much further north. Fish that we might have once found on the coast of New York and Long Island, we're now finding in Maine. Okay, so these fish are, are, are migrating north uh, year by year to find cooler water. This is a cool image as well. So we can see that the geophysical disasters that are as a result of the tectonic plates under the surface of Earth moving around, we're not seeing an increase in, in those circumstances or in those catastrophes. So earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, volcanic activity, we're not seeing an increase in those things. But the catastrophes that are a result of weather are increasing dramatically. Um, so tropical storms, hurricanes, floods, forest fires, we're seeing an increase in these things. And that obviously is an indication that the weather uh, is changing dramatically. And so it's not only the number of catastrophes that is increasing, but also their severity. The severity and size is increasing. So you all probably remember only a couple of months ago, there were wildfires that were burning in California that were millions of square miles in size. Okay, so that's obviously a big, big issue, <laughs> uh, as it not only puts uh, human beings in danger and human property in danger, but it also endangers all of the species that live in the forest um, and, and the tree species as well. So we can see that there's a, a gradual increase in the number of acres every year that have been burned due to forest fires. Mr. Fifteen was the, the worst. Yes, Malachi? Um, you know, some of those like forest fires happen because people actually like set them. Like, like there's a lot of, like, not like, I get people act like set them, okay? But I'm saying like people will set their house on fire like on purpose and then like get the insurance from it and then just move to a whole different place. Yeah, that's pretty malicious. I don't, yeah, I, I imagine that that's not happening often. Um, no, it's not often. It's ha it happens like like 300 times a year. Yeah, um, and I, and 
I actually had a student in my AP biology class last year whose dad was maybe chief of police in Charlotte, but anyway, I don't know what his exact role was, but he was a firefighter, uh, not chief of police, but chief of firefighters. Um, and his dad was telling us that, you know, they do have to do those investigations. They try to determine the source of the fire, the cause of it. Um, and in this case, obviously that would be useful to know when people are making insurance claims. Um, you can't just necessarily claim that your house burned down, but then come to find out you burned it down intentionally. But yeah, sometimes these fires are started by, they are, they are often started by human beings because of carelessness. So people- Mr. Run, fire, fire, yes? I know one fire, well, it was, on the, it was on the news one time, but one fire got started because somebody was doing a um, baby reveal or whatever it's called. Yes, that was that did happen, and that was probably the most publicized case, and that was this year. Um, someone was using uh, maybe firecrackers or something like that to do some type of gender reveal for their baby, um, and it ended up sparking one of the largest fire, one of the largest wildfires of the year. What'd you say, Malachi? Why can't people just pop balloons? Like, why do they take it to the extreme? Yeah, good question. So, uh, September 1984, we can see that the size of um, the glaciers, the size of the ice landscape uh, on, in the North Pole was much larger than it is or than it was in September 2016. And we can speculate that it's even smaller now than it was then. Let's watch this video really quickly. Glaciers have been shaping our world for millions of years. But as climate change warms the planet, glaciers are disappearing. Not only altering the landscapes they leave behind, but changing our oceans, weather, and life on Earth as we know it. A glacier is a huge mass of ice that moves slowly over land. Glaciers can be classified into two general groups, alpine glaciers and ice sheets. Alpine glaciers form on mountainsides and move downward through valleys. Sometimes they create valleys by pushing dirt, soil, and other materials out of their way. These glaciers are found on every continent except Australia. Ice sheets, unlike alpine glaciers, are not limited to mountainous areas. They form broad domes and spread out from their centers in all directions. As ice sheets spread, they cover everything around them with a thick blanket of ice, including valleys, plains, and even entire mountains. The largest ice sheets are called continental glaciers. They cover vast areas, including most of Antarctica and the island of Greenland. Glaciers can form over years when more snow piles up than melts. Soon after falling, the snow begins to become denser and more tightly packed. When new snow falls and buries the previous year's snow, the bottom layer becomes even more compressed. The dense grainy ice that has survived one year's melt cycle is called fern. When the ice grows thick enough, the fern grains fuse into a huge mass called glacial ice. The glacier may begin to move under its own weight through a process called compression melting. As they move, glaciers erode or wear away the land beneath and around them. When glaciers began their latest retreat less than 20,000 years ago, they left behind many landscape features such as lakes, valleys, and mountains. Glaciers provide people with many useful resources. Glacial till provides fertile soil for growing crops, and deposits of sand and gravel are used to make concrete and asphalt. Many rivers are fed by the melting ice of glaciers. The most important resource provided by glaciers is freshwater. Earth's average temperature has been increasing dramatically for more than a century. Glaciers can act as indicators of global warming and climate change in several ways. Melting ice sheets contribute to rising sea levels. 
As ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland melt, they raise sea levels, adding fresh water to the ocean every day. The loss of glacial ice also reduces the amount of fresh water available for plants and animals on land. Large additions of fresh water change the ocean ecosystem as well as ocean currents. Additionally, less salt in the ocean could disturb the Gulf Stream, drastically changing the weather on land as well. Since glaciers are so sensitive to climate change, the increased speed of glacier melt is an early warning system for the rest of the planet. And if global warming goes unchecked, many, if not all, alpine glaciers could disappear completely. Okay, so we've got about glaciers five minutes left. I need to uh, get through this stuff. <clears throat> But another way humans impact the environment is by burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are so-called fossil fuels because they literally are um, the results of organic material that was once living and that died many hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago. Uh, it became compressed, it got heated up as it was you know, pushed down closer to the core of the earth. Um, and now we can extract it and use it to fuel our day-to-day -day lives to get electricity, to move our cars, uh, and so on and so forth. However, these things are non-renewable source of energy, which means that they will eventually run out. Um, and it also means that they introduce unnatural substances into our atmosphere and into the environment. Um, so here's what it looks like to extract some of the natural oil. You all would have been babies or toddlers when this happened, but uh, one of these oil rigs, which was off of the coast of Louisiana in the Gulf Coast, uh, it exploded and it introduced mil millions of metric tons of oil into the ocean down there and killed off many different uh, species of life. And so these things have real consequences. Um, we can also see an oil refinery here. So the oil that you all, the gas that you pump into your car is not the same thing that comes out of the ground. Um, it has to go through a refinery process in which uh, certain chemicals are added, certain chemicals are removed um, in order to make it usable, in order so, so that it doesn't damage your vehicle. Um, so it has to go through this refining process, and that process also introduces a lot of carbon dioxide and a lot of dam damaging and harmful chemicals into the atmosphere. There's also this controversial practice of fracking. Um, essentially, fracking is a process that removes oil from the ground. But in doing so, it can contaminate water, and some of that water um, gets into natural sources of water and can eventually uh, leak into a, a drinking water source It can contaminate the drinking water. It's also controversial because uh, one political party believes that we should continue fracking. Um, they believe that it helps the economy. People need the jobs uh, that come with fracking, and it's not that harmful to the environment. The other political, the other major political party in our country believes that fracking is extremely harmful uh, to the environment. We should end it, um, that there's no place for it in 2020. We've got to find other renewable sources of energy. And uh, even though there might be an immediate economic hit in the long term, we'll be able to replace those jobs in healthier ways. So that's why it's controversial. I'm moving quickly, I know, but I want to get through this so I can explain the activity to you guys. <clears throat> Uh, invasive species are another way that human beings have impacted the environment. Um, the problem with invasive species is that you're taking something that is not native to an ecosystem and you're putting it into that ecosystem. Um, what happens is that that non-native species can then decimate the native species. Um, and it can also eventually just turn, become, become dominant in that ecosystem. So one example is cogent grass. Cogent grass is an Asian plant that arrived in the southeastern United States in the form of seeds. Uh, it was totally unintentional because it was just packed into, into packing material. Unfortunately, it's now spreading across the southeastern United States, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. And uh, the native wildlife don't like to eat this grass. Um, and so it's growing uncontrolled because, you know, typically you would have rabbits and deer that would be happy to feast on this new 
species, but for whatever reason, this is not in their appetite. And additionally, uh, cogen grass is extremely flammable, so it increases the likelihood of wildfire. And so this is a problem that, that those governments are really trying to find a way to deal with. Um, there are also European green crabs. Somehow we don't know these green crabs that would have that would have come from the northwestern coast of Europe by Great Britain and France. They made their way all the way to the San Francisco Bay in the 1980s, probably from the barge of some ship. Um, and they totally have outcompeted the native species for the food and the habitat. Uh, and they're also eating huge amounts of the shellfish, which has had both an economic and eco ecological impact. So these non-native species, and there are examples that we're gonna talk about next time uh, in North Carolina that have huge impacts on, on their environments. Ozone depletion, we talked about that. And lastly, bioaccumulation. <clears throat> so the chemicals that we burn in those refineries, oftentimes they will get incorporated into clouds. When the clouds rain, they carry with them those chemicals. The rain carries those chemicals. You've heard of acid rain before, I'm sure. That acid rain eventually makes its way to the ocean or into lakes where photoplankton pick it up very small forms of life, probably some forms that are microscopic, you can't even see them with your naked eye. Uh, they pick up those chemicals, they absorb those chemicals. Then larger forms of life that are still pretty small, we call them zooplankton, they come along and eat those phytoplankton. And so they end up getting a lot of the chemicals, even though the phytoplankton may have only had a little bit in them, because they're eating a lot of phytoplankton, they're, they're picking up a lot of the chemicals. Then a larger fish, comes and eats those phytoplankton. And then maybe a larger fish comes and eats that smaller fish. And so as you move up the food chain, you're getting more and more of those chemicals. And eventually those chemicals will make their way into mammals um, like orca whales, or in some cases, human beings, because we eat the large fish. Um, so essentially we're eating the chemicals. And you know, in some cases, people who have heavy seafood diets have been found to have a lot of these uh, contaminating chemicals in their bodies. All right, so I apologize, we went over. I do wanna quickly <clears throat> introduce two things. So there is the, there are two asynchronous assignments that are from this first lesson. There's the human impact on the environment practice assignment, which is pretty simple. All you'll need to do is kind of type in some information about these human impacts. But because you guys are the honors class, I wanted to do a presentation with you all that will require that you work in partners, work with partners. I think Elliot, that- I had, a, I had a question about that. Um, I was looking over it and um, like, how do you, are you choosing or like, how is it gonna work? So that's what I was curious about. Um, if you click on the assignment, does it automatically assign you to a group? That's what I was hoping it would do. I don't um, think so. Hold on, let me go back to it. How do you get bullet points? I've never used Google Slides. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, it doesn't automatically group you. Um, I don't think so. Let me share this slide with you, Malachi, really quickly. So if you have a word, you know, if you have a text box like this, bullet points will be one of the options at the top of your screen. But okay, let me put you into groups really quickly. I'm gonna edit this assignment. And you all, you, you'll have until, I do wanna present on Tuesday of next week so you all can work together over the weekend. Uh, obviously, I'll remind you on Monday, and I'll try to have more time for you all to work on Monday. We're doing a project? You could call it that, yes. Are we supposed to reach out to the rest of the group through their email, I guess? Um, well, I'm hoping that most people are here right now. But let's see. Let me go back. Are we I know we do have a couple people. What'd you say? 
Are we going to be in assigned groups? Yeah, I was hoping that it would automatically assign you when you clicked on the assignment. I thought that I set up the settings to do that, but apparently not. So here's what I want to do. Um, Does anybody want to volunteer for population growth? I think we can have two people per group, which is partners. Does anyone have any preference as to what topic they explore? I'd like to do pollution. Can I sorry, do Mr. pollution? I, I think I heard Gaddy say she'd like to do pollution. What else? Yeah. Um, wait, how oh, much? Who, who, who else? Can I do pollution? I like okay. learning about pollution. Okay, so pollution will be Gabby and Ayana. Mr. Ray. Yes. I thought this whole time, I thought you we were supposed to do, I was doing all of them. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Yeah, luckily, I'm only asking that you each do one. Anybody else have any preferences? Climate change. I'm going to do population growth. OK. So, to Malachi. Who else is here today? All right, I'm going to put Omari on burning fossil fuels. Dante. Oh, Angel's here. Angel, long time no see. I have a lot to do. Stephanie Adrian. Now I'll go back up to the top. Uh, let's see. That's Angel. Here's Joseph. Here's Castro. Who am I missing? Olivia. I know that Jalen is not here today. Somebody else wasn't here. Kiki? Oh, yeah, thank you. Perfect. All right, so I will send out a uh, Malachi, are you in our remind group? No. What is that? Okay. What did you What's say, that? Castro? What are you doing together? Yes, you're supposed to. Yeah, you guys will prepare these presentations together. Um, the, all of the that instructions are basically there, but I do want you to work together. Do you want me to do that off my phone? Yes, please. Like through iMessage? Yeah, it'll work through iMessage, or you can download the app, either way. Uh, Rudd Bio 2. Did you get the H? Don't forget the H. Rudd H Bio. Oh. At Rudd H Bio 2. Eight ten ten. Wait, am I supposed to put the at? Yes, no. I think you do need to type the at. This thing is not delivered for some reason. Ten, ten. Hmm. Wait, what? Let me 
see if I can. Let me try and call Here, I might be able to share a link with you. Because the only other reason it would say that is if my phone's off, but it's not. Okay, well, everybody, it's 11.44, so I appreciate you all staying, but I want you to have some time for lunch. Um, you are good to go. And I'm going to